here on the Colour of Country Life Flow FM. Great to be speaking with the National Party's new candidate for the seat of Mildura in the November election, Jade Benham. How are you, Jade? I'm great, Ricky. How are you? Good, thank you. You'll be familiar to some listeners as Mayor of Swan Hill, but uh, in your profile that the National Party's provided, I want to drill right down into your your, your current ac- occupation and what you're doing. Uh, you're on, on an orchard, aren't you? Yeah, so my husband, I married an almond farmer, which is why I, I came back to live in Robinvale after many years abroad and living in cities. Uh, married an almond farmer, so he actually manages one of the almond farms in Robinvale. Yep, and then uh, you're also, uh, I think you've got some history uh, elsewhere in the electorate as well. Uh, was it uh, um, somewhere else in the local area? Yeah, so Swan Hill. I grew up in Swan Hill on uh, on my parents' stone fruit block. Oh, it was vines, I suppose, for a little while, as most most of those little small blocks have changed changed uh, produce over the the course of their life, growing everything from grapes to capsicum, tomatoes, and that's how I spent my summers growing up as a kid. There were never any summer vacations; it was always working for Dad on the block. Oh, and any was, apricot? Uh, probably any apricot cutting amongst all of that. No, well, he did have apricots for a little while, but he didn't really like them and there wasn't much return on apricots, so that didn't last long. But uh, nectarines and peaches were sort of the cornerstones of of how we spent our summers, which was actually probably, look, looking back, it's a really good thing. That's probably where my work ethic came from, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly uh, adaptability in farming as well, as we know our farmers are, whether they're horticulturalists or on the land as well. They know they've got to move to where the market's going. That's exactly right. And my father still says that he was the first one in the district to plant capsicums and that's where he made his money and now everyone does it so he got out of it. So, yeah, adaptability and resilience too. I remember my mum had to go back to work as a kid. She had the uh, the privilege of being a stay-at-home farm mum, which was terrific because we attended a, a school around the corner with 11 kids, I think, at most at one point. And, uh, you know, they got wiped out with hail in 1991, the entire crop gone, single-income family and and my mum ended up having to go back to work, and she hasn't stopped since. She now owns a jewellery shop in, in Swan Hill. Um, so, yeah, that resilience, that adaptability, and being able to pivot and, uh, and do things. And, you know, my parents were always, because we grew up in a really small community, they were always on different committees, different groups. Dad was the footy club president for many years, then went on to the Central Murray League board chair, and my mum was president of the netball club, and we were always playing sports. So it was that really idyllic sort of small-town country lifestyle that I grew up with, and I think that that's where my probably my entire character comes from, I think. Yeah, and uh, it didn't end up in you being changed to the district in a sense. You ended up getting out and abroad, as you say. As a, What are the roles that you've played in your career that uh, now you've found your way back into the Swan Hill district? Well, I actually started a broadcasting career at uh, 1532.3SH with Harold Pratt back in the day. Um, in 1997, they launched an FM station, so I got a traineeship, actually, straight out of school, which is unheard of these days to get traineeships in, uh, in radio broadcasting and, and uh, advertising. But I did that, uh, stayed there for six years. I actually came back two or three times throughout my travel, worked my way sort of up to Queensland, the Northern Territory, ended up at Nova 100 while, when they first launched, and then... Um, then decided that I was going to go and live in a tree. I was creative director at the age of 25 and was working far too hard for a 25-year-old, in my opinion. So went overseas to do the camp counsellor thing and travel for what I thought was going to be a three-month trip and ended up coming back three years later to try and extend my visa. By that stage, I'd moved to London uh, to work in digital media. So I changed direction then. But whilst I was back, I uh, was the trainer and umpire, netball umpire at the local footy club and met my now husband. So the rest, as they say, is history. But I ended up with all that experience that that I gained working overseas as a a medical assistant at Stanford University and in digital media in London. Uh, Came back here, brought all that knowledge back and started a, um, a grassroots small digital business to help small rural businesses with their online presence and their digital marketing, which is, again, that was supposed to be a five-year project. 11 years later, we're still going. Yeah, and this is experience that's been recognised by the Swan Hill community in that they've elected you mayor at the last elections. Uh, What are you wanting to bring as the mayor in terms of now running for the seat uh, for state politics uh, in the seat of Mildura? You know, I was elected first past the post, which was great, and, and had considered 
standing for mayor because councillors obviously elect elect who is mayor and who is deputy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I wanted another year of learning. I'm I'm smart enough to know that I don't know everything um, and need to. And you're always learning. So I wanted another year of learning, um, and all of that communication background, I suppose, has really helped me in my role as mayor because one of the issues that was really illustrated before I got on to council was that nobody ever knew what or why the council do what they did. So that was something that I really brought into my role as councillor and then mayor, is to really communicate and be very transparent about what's going on. The reason for me standing for state parliament, I guess, is first of all, you know, over particularly over the last two or three years, it's become really apparent that we shouldn't feel like we're not Victorians just based on our postcode. There's no reason why someone in Underbull should feel less like a Victorian and less like they're being looked after than someone that lives in Malvern, for example. And that's really been amplified, I think, over the last couple of years. So that was my, my first reason, is that we need to flip, flip the government back, <clears throat> back to a coalition government, excuse me. And, um, and I'm not one to sit by, never have been, not one to sit by and grizzle about things and not jump in headfirst and do something about it. So if I'm going to whinge about something, I will do everything within my capacity to... To change it. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I just wanted to focus on something Ali Kappa, where you're one of your competitors, obviously the incumbent independent MP for Mildura, has gone about on about this thing she calls rate gate, this uh, scenario mm. where she says regional councils are struggling to meet their budgets because of, you know, the, the, the difficulty in getting rates from, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the I guess the revenue base that they have in regional areas. So it didn't really raise a whimper, this uh, campaign of hers, though, during the federal election, when that's really what she was on about, was getting more federal funds. Uh, what can we do for councils so we make sure our roads and other infrastructure are, are up to scratch? Yeah, it, look, in a rate capping environment, things have got really, really difficult. You know, we're, we're set to raise rates by 1.75% when the inflation rate is, you know, over 9% and the cost of materials and things to get infrastructure projects done is well up over 30 to 50%. So um, there is a, a massive issue here and the, the rate gate issue is one that's been peddled. This isn't a new thing. This has been going on for a long time, but because of the Andrews government, the rate capping environment that we're in now, the sustainability of small rural and regional councils is getting more and more difficult. And even in Swan Hill, we're in a really good financial position. Um, even this year, the budget was really tough. So what, uh, what we need is for the federal government now to step up with their financial assistance grants. It was always promised that we would get uh, 1% to 2%, I think it was, of the, uh, the whole nation's GST to subsidise council uh, books so that we wouldn't have to raise, you know, to, to counteract that, that rate capping uh, thing that, that we're facing. So, so that's what we're asking for is, is our fair share. Instead of all of those the inner city councils that have, you know, maybe 300 metres of road or three kilometre, 30 kilometres of roads to look after, very, very small inner city suburbs, Stonington, Darabin, et cetera, et cetera, instead of them getting the exact same amount that we get out in the regions when we've got 20,000 kilometres of roads, you know, we need to get our fair share. It needs to be according to geography, according to, you know, roads management, all of that kind of stuff. There's no reason somebody in Darabin should or we should be paying the same rates as someone in Chirac. That's, it's just madness. Now, um, I just wanted to come back to that point you made about, I guess, the last couple of years, which I think is a sort of oblique reference, if I can, to the lockdowns and restrictions that were imposed across the state rather than maybe more so to Melbourne than regional electorates. You're up against not only a Liberal candidate, but Ali Kappa herself. How effective do you feel Ali Kappa's been in terms of getting that differential treatment she said she would pursue when it came to things like lockdowns and restrictions? Yeah, look, I don't want to turn it into, you know, a, an individual mudslinging match, but there's been a couple of times, I think, that um, that most people who pay attention or are engaged with the political system would know that, um, you know, if you're an independent candidate, and this is wherever you are, effectively you're in opposition to the government. There's been a couple of times there where, in fact, there's been more than a couple of times, in fact, over 80% of the time, where the voting hasn't been in opposition to the government particularly with the state of emergency bills, et cetera, et cetera. The National Party, in particular, have promised absolutely no more lockdowns, um, regardless of how things go um, with COVID, the flu, et cetera, et cetera. It's over, as far as we are concerned. Um, and the state of emergency bills and the pandemic bills, vaccine mandates, should also be repealed. All right, Jade, look, we're running out of time here, but then we've got to have a fair few more chats with you and the other candidates before the November election. Thanks for joining us today on Flow. Absolute pleasure, Ricky. Thanks for having me.